I left you with a bottle last class, didn't I? Yeah. Would you, someone, call those numbers out to me? What was the consumption function? 126 plus uh, 0.95Y. 126 plus 0.95Y. All right. 21. 21. G? 19. 19. Net exports? Negative 6. Negative 6. So I give you the model, the numbers, and the first thing you generally do with it is you calculate the equilibrium level of GDP or the equilibrium level of spending given these four spending flows, right? And we set it up and we say that Y equals C plus I plus G plus net exports. And we just plug the numbers in. 126 plus 0.95Y plus 21 plus 19 minus 6. Everybody okay with that? So, doing it real quick. We got 147, 157, 166 minus 6. I get 160 plus 0.95Y would somebody check that? Is that correct? Okay. What do I do now? Subtract 0.95y from each side, remembering that this y on this side has a coefficient of 1. So 1 minus 0.95 is 0.05y equals 160. And then when we divide by 0.05, we get our equilibrium, noted by the y star, to be $3,200. Questions so far? Anybody? I'm sorry? Good. That was my next question. You're a step ahead of me. Okay? We know this is how much spending is going on in the economy. But the next question is, is this enough spending to create enough jobs to put everybody to work? I say that again. Is this enough spending to create enough jobs to put everybody to work? And to answer that, what do we need to know? We need to know what full employment is. So this was also given to you. What is full employment? 3,000. 3, so now, what's going on? Just look at the numbers. More than we need. We're spending more than we can produce. We're trying to buy more than we can produce. And if you're trying to buy more of something than is available, what typically happens to its price? When you, everybody's trying to buy it, and when you're running out of it, the price goes up. Think of fresh water in a hurricane, right? So when we find that our equilibrium is more than our possible or potential output, the result is rising prices or inflation. And the first model we did last class had a recessionary gap. This reflects an inflationary economy. And if we were to do this graphically, am I still on the camera, George, over here? Yes, sir. Cool. I am so pleased. I make these videos. Some of them I put on YouTube, but most of them I just go home and watch myself. It's so cool. <laughs> All right. When you see that kind of aggregate supply curve, what do you know? That's a Keynesian model. What's another term for that supply curve? What kind of supply curve is it? It is a sharp break supply curve. This is to, just to explain the theory. The world doesn't look like this, but it helps us explain the theory. Okay? And what's going on right here at this sharp break? Full employment. That corresponds to full employment output, YFE or QFE, interchangeable terms. What's this part of the supply curve referred to, that vertical portion? The supply, I'm sorry, the classical range. Where is our demand curve in this model? It's going to intersect somewhere in the vertical range because we're beyond full employment. Think of it this way. Uh, the demand curve, aggregate demand is out here. Let me get rid of these numbers for a minute. The aggregate demand curve, if you could continue this horizontal line, that corresponds to the $3,200 equal, uh, equilibrium we solved. Okay? So the demand curve is past this point, past full employment, it's out here. And so the equilibrium intersection up here 
is on the vertical part of the supply curve. What's going on anytime we have an equilibrium along this part of the supply curve? Inflation. inflation. When you're in the classical range, above full employment, you have an inflationary economy. All right? So now what? You say, well, if full employment is 3,000 and the economy is spending 3,200, the difference in the two is called the gap. And in this case, it's an inflationary gap. So, it's really nice that everybody has a job. We're at full employment. What would be the unemployment rate there? We're saying 5% is full employment. Okay? We'll get more into that later. Uh, it's nice everybody's working, but unfortunately inflation's going up. But what does inflation do to you or me? We pay higher for about the same value. Yeah, you keep paying higher power. prices for stuff. Makes us less. Say again. Purchasing power. Your purchasing power or the value of your dollar is diminishing. Think about it this way. If inflation goes up by 7% and you get a 3% pay raise, how well off are you? You're still 4% behind. You see that? You still can buy less than you could. Another just quick sideline. If inflation were running at 8%, if you divide 8 into the number 72, you get 9. Remember that? Public school math. Right? At 8% inflation, prices will double every 9 years. Prices will double. Your rent will double in 9 years. And back about 1979, inflation ran up as high as a little over 12%. Which meant what? Every six years, prices would double if it stayed at that rate. You suppose people's incomes were going up that fast? No way. Now, you don't hear much talk about it these days because inflation is very low, comfortably under 2%. People aren't too worried about it, although we know what? Food prices the last couple of years have, have gone up. Okay. Beef prices, goodness gracious, I'm trying to find the cheapest cut of steak I can. Oh, damn hamburger meat. Yeah, even hamburger meat. Gasoline prices, right? They've gone through the roof. But generally, for you and me, and, and for most of you in your lifetime, your adult lifetime, inflation's been very low. You haven't worried about it. But for the, the, the old fogies around who remember 12% inflation and the, the rapid inflation of the 70s, we know we don't want to go there again. You talk about unemployment a problem? Sure it is. But so is inflation. Inflation just strips away your standard of living. And so... People are very, very sensitive to this. They want to keep that inflation rate low. I want you to remember that later in the course when we start talking about monetary policy. Now, our issue right now is we have an inflationary gap of $200. And according to the Keynesian view, what are we going to do about it? What's another? Give me, give me three other terms for Keynesian economists. Uh, so Saltwater economists. What else? Fiscalists. Fiscalists. Demand, demand. demand management economists, because they focus on the demand curve. Think of the term fiscalists. What we're going to do is, as Keynesian economists, we're going to say, what are our fiscal policy options? What can we do about this inflationary gap? Fiscal policy. What does that mean? The tools of fiscal policy. Tools to fix the economy, there are two, exercised by our Congress and President. Government spending, and taxes. Government spending and taxes. Those are the tools of fiscal policy. And so when we talk about what are the fiscal policy options to deal with this, we're going to say, well, you can either change government spending or you can change taxes. Everybody tracking with that okay? And then there are the equations we use to say how much. And we say delta Y star, the change in equilibrium, will equal K times delta G. What's delta Y star here? Uh, it's the gap. It's the gap. It's the change we want. We want to bring spending from 3,200 down to 3,000. So we know this is $200. What is K? 
1 over 1 minus the MPC. We call it the multiplier or sometimes the spending multiplier. Somebody tell me how the spending multiplier works in one or two sentences. Uh, if you were to have like a certain amount of money, like 10 bucks, and you spent 9 bucks, the next person will say 90%, and the next person will spend 90%. So Good. So. If Uncle Sam gives me $100, and I spend, in this case, how much? $95. $95. Wherever I spend it, they spend 95% of that $95, and the process repeats it. It repeats itself until that initial $100 I got multiplies into a lot more spending in the economy. So, K is, just parenthetically, K equals 1 over 1 minus the MPC. And the MPC is always the coefficient in, turn, in front of Y. So here we get 1 over 1 minus 0.95 which is 1 over 0 0.05, which is 20. You comfortable with that? So now I can say 200 equals 20 times delta G, and now I can tell how much spending change I need to get out of this inflationary gap. And in this case, it's $10. And again, I don't worry about negative signs and positive signs. I use, God forgive me, I use common sense. Do they need to increase spending or decrease spending? Why decrease? Because we've got too damn much spending going on now. We're spending more than we can produce. You okay with that? All right. What's the equation for taxes? Delta Y star equals K times the MPC times the change in taxes. We add the MPC element in there. We'll discuss why that is later. Plug in the numbers you know. We know the gap is 200. We know K is 20. We know the MPC is 0.95. Solve for delta TX. What you wind up is delta TX equals 200 divided by 19. And now someone with a calculator will... 10.53? Yes. Good. $10.53. You want to increase taxes or you want to decrease taxes? Increase. Why increase? Decrease. Why decrease? <laughs> yeah, you want to increase taxes so that way there's not as much money floating around. What's the problem in the economy when we first solve that equilibrium? There's too much spending. Going too on. much spending. Remember, Keynes is all about spending. If you want, to pe want people to spend less money, what do you do to their taxes? Raise them. You raise them. Okay? So we would say raise taxes. So these then decrease. These then are our fiscal policy options. You don't do both of them. You do one or the other. Or in the real world, you do a, probably a combination. Okay? How are we doing so far?